We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. The beginning of the earth. And we're going to focus on some Australian fossil sites to learn about what these fossil uh, sites tell us about the history of the earth and tell us about the different plants and animals that we have here today. You may have heard of something called mass extinctions. Most of us know about mass extinctions linked to the disappearance, the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But there have actually been five major mass extinctions throughout Earth's history. Um, and they're really focused on whence we've had complex life around. So from about 600 million years ago to the present, we've had these five mass extinctions. And I'll be talking about some of those throughout our session as well today. So I'm going to share some slides, but I do have some fabulous specimens and fossils that I'll be showing you as well today. I'll just have a little look before we get started. So the fossils and the geology tell us a really important parts of the fossil of the, the history of the earth. So different things that I've got right here at the moment, we've got some plant fossils. These ones are impression fossils where it's an imprint of the plant that's left behind. A trilobite, this is a really big one. We also get different things like these sea urchins, seashells, impressions of fish. So again, that's that squashed impression. Teeth. We also get fossil footprints that are really, really common. Fossil footprints tell us great stories about how big certain animals are, whether they were running or they were walking. And even something like this one here. This is one of my favourite types of fossils and they're called coprolites. And they're actually, guess what, fossilised poo. But they are really, really important. And obviously scientists don't want to be known as the poo scientists. So they actually give them this great word coprolites instead. But they can tell scientists what different animals have been eating, whether they're herbivores or carnivores. So they're really important as well. And if I just scroll over, here are my some of my favourite types of fossils. This is one group together. And these are called ammonites. You may have seen ones like these before. We've got lots of different shapes and sizes, different ways. This one's got a squiggly boundary of the different cells and segments. And ammonites tell us another really important part of the story. Yes, Jackie, we've got a question about the fossils. Shala just wanted to know, where did you find them? Ah, well... Oh, I'm a little bit blurry. Hang on. There we go. So I actually did um, study paleontology uh, way, way back um, in university. And we did do some field trips to places where you are allowed to collect fossils. So there are some things that I have collected. But most of my fossil collection, I have actually bought over the last, dare I say, 20 to 30 years. So a lot of these I buy when I go to museums. You can see really big things like this, especially once they've been polished. So for this one, it's these white parts that are actually a fossil called nautiloids. This is probably one of my oldest fossils at 400, over 400 million years old. So a lot of them I buy. So different museums, um, usually when if you go to visit, if they've got lots of fossils and things in that museum, they'll often sell some fossils um, in the shops as well. And mostly you know that they're coming from um, correct, suitable places. So it is good to actually purchase. Most places you can't go and find a fossil and pick it up and take it home. It belongs to the landowner or in some cases it belongs to the government if it's public spaces. But there are lots of places that you can purchase them as well. So the, um, this follows on with uh, Zachary's questions. Are the fossils fake? Okay, so these ones are real. Um, 
so there are some places that will fake fossils and some of them what they'll do is something called um uh, it's a little bit of we call it museum magic so this is probably a good example of one of those we can see these bits on it here now when they dig up the fossil sometimes they fall off and it may be that it fell off of this actual fossil and they stick it back on so it's not that they've faked it but it's because things get damaged they sometimes glue things back together other times they are making it up. They might find different fossils and put it together to make a new one. Um, but it often can be quite an important part of the story to do that. But these ones are what we would call real fossils. They've been um, excavated from fossil sites. And what you might find like in this one here, the one side of it is all shiny. So what they do is they polish it. This one's actually fossilised coral. And if we show you the other side, it doesn't look nearly as exciting, does it? I can still see all the different segments that make up the bits of coral, but when they polish it, it often makes those fossils a lot clearer. So that's another thing that you can often find when you're buying them, that when they're polished, they can look a little bit different, but it does help see the original fossil. Uh, Karen, there are so many people <laughs> wanting to know about the fossil that's behind you. Oh, this way here. Okay, now I will bring it towards me. This one is definitely what we call a replica. So the closer I get it, we can see that it's not even a real rock. It's a little bit of concrete. So this is what we call a model. And I use it as what we call a prop. So just to show that we've got stuff on dinosaurs. So this one is 100% a fake one that I would I just have in the background. So it's not a real one at all. <laughs> um, same way, oh, I should be, if I look through the plants, these ones are actually real. So I've got a piece of opal, an ammonite, and a trilobite, and those ones are real ones. Um, any more fossil questions, Jackie, or should we just move forward to look at some of these mass extinctions? Uh, there are heaps and heaps of questions, but I think maybe we move on for now and there is somebody who's really keen on knowing more about the mass extinction so maybe if uh if we get on to that they will stop asking me that question excellent let me just find my slides for us uh there we go so to think about what's been going on in the earth we need to think about the earth forming processes so the earth started to form 4.6 billion years old so that's 4600 million just keep adding zeros until we get to how many years that is. So a really long time, the earth when it was forming was a volcanic earth. So it was very hot, lots of, lots of movement around. The crust and the layers inside the earth weren't the same as they are today. We were also during that time hit by a lot of meteorite impacts. One massive meteorite impact actually blew out a, a massive chunk of the earth and was part of the formation of the, the process that formed the moon. So meteorite impacts we can still see today, many places around the world, but the best place is actually to look at the moon about how many meteorite impacts there have been over time. So lots of things have been hitting the earth and we've also had lots of these volcanic and earth forming processes. So it wasn't a very stable place and there wasn't life for a very long time. When we first started seeing life on Earth, this is what it would have looked like. These are stromatolites. Now, stromatolites date back to about 3.6 billion years old, so quite old in the, um, the history of the Earth. And what they do is produce oxygen. They're actually a cyanobacteria, a blue-green algae, that produce oxygen. And so what happens every time the tide was going in and out, they were sticky. So little bits of sediment would stick to them and they would grow these mushroom shaped rocks. So these rocks that we're seeing here are living fossils called stromatolites. This place in Western Australia called Shark Bay, you can still see this happening today. So for billions of years, we have had this process happening. We can see the little cyanobacteria and the growth of these fossils here. We can see it again in this fossil here. And it is quite amazing. I used to work at the Australian Museum in Sydney and they had a 
big stromatolite there that was 2.8 billion years old. And I know they've actually just opened up again um, after lockdown. And you can actually go and visit this particular fossil and you can touch it. So it was the oldest thing that I was ever able to touch. And I used to touch it nearly every day because of such an important story of that production of oxygen. Without the stromatolites producing, bubbling away little bits of oxygen, um, we wouldn't have the atmosphere that we have today. So Western Australia in Shark Bay, we can still see these amazing stromatolites. We are going to move all the way to South Australia now to the Flinders Ranges. And we're going to start looking at more complex life. So for a very long time, it was single celled, very simple organisms. And about 600 million years ago, we started seeing complex life in the fossils. Now, this is an early one here, it was quite small, found in the Flinders Ranges. And it was so important that this time was given a time period named after this place. And it's the Eddy Curran. And these particular fossils were never seen before. So it was a really all very new organisms that were discovered in the fossil record in South Australia in the Flinders Ranges. And it's just before a period of time we call the Cambrian explosion, when all of a sudden in the fossil record, we start seeing lots and lots of complex life. Now, one of those reasons is before this time, things were very soft bodied and they didn't fossilize. They were too soft to leave an impression in the rocks. And Two, it was just that time when all of these complex life were starting to evolve all around the world. This is what we call a scientific illustration. So if you love art and you love fossils, this could be the job for you in the future. You get to actually recreate these environments of the past. This is that particular fossil there that we could see. All the little green bits are early plants. The rest are actually looking at early sponges. So here's an early type of sponge a type of animal, early coral, and different early organisms that are going to be the ancestors of our arthropods, our insects into the future. This is that Cambrian Sea. We can see the stromatolites still working away and some very weird and wonderful animals that we don't actually have around. So lots of different animal types and groups and body shapes came around at this time, many of them because of these mass extinctions, we don't have today. Only the survivors of each of these mass extinctions um, are the ancestors of the animals that we have around today. And this is what was happening over time, big spikes of evolution where we had lots of variety of life coming into, into um, the fossil record and then big drops. These big drops and big spikes. Each one of these drops is one of these mass extinctions. And it's when a lot of species disappear in geologically a short period of time. The first one happened about 440 million years ago. So not long after that Cambrian explosion with a big variety of life was being formed. This nautiloids, the long um, uh, pointy shells with the squid-like animals coming out the end were one of the things that disappeared in that first mass extinction in the Ordovician when we had 85% of all life at the time only in the oceans disappeared during that period. And it was a time when there was a lot of movement as well. So things are not where they used to be. So if we think about where the continents are, where the land masses on Earth are now, over time they have moved around. So um, Gondwana was when a southern land mass was actually in the South Pole during the Ordovician, there were shallow seas and the sea level dropped and it was cold. So it was about 600 million years. We had this colder period of time and that was part of what was impacting that first mass extinction. The late Devonian, 374 million years ago, about 75% of life disappeared. The largest by far is the Permian extinction, 250 million years ago, where 95% of all life on earth and in the oceans disappeared. And they call this period the great dying. We'll look at it a bit um, closer later. The Jurassic extinction, 200 million years ago. And by far the most famous is the Cretaceous extinction, the extinction of the dinosaurs, where not only the dinosaurs, but most of our the big marine reptiles and 76% of plants and animal life on earth disappeared during that time. 
Now, Jackie, before I move on, are there any questions popping up about these mass extinctions? I will go into each of them in, in more detail. Um, I think in general, a lot of people are wondering whether it's mass, distinct, uh, mass extinctions or the fossils, how do we know how old these things are? Absolutely. So it's a bit of a combination of sciences that they use. So the people that are studying fossils are paleontologists, but we also have our geologists. And geologists can date the rocks as well. So they can look at different minerals. They can do different types of testing. Um, so there's some uranium dating. There's potassium argon dating. I won't go into it. Um, it's quite complicated. But they can use that to work out how old certain rocks are. And if they know what how old that rock layer is, they can also then update the fossils in those particular rock layers. But if we have a quick look here at my ammonites, remember my, some of my favourite fossils, these kinds of um, ones give us a clue as well. So these are often called sort of indicator fossils or index fossils because different types of ammonites are found during different age periods. So different sizes, different shapes, the different edging can often tell us and date those particular rock periods. If we look at the trilobites as well, we've got a really big trilobite here. And here we go, we've got quite a different looking smaller one. The different patterns in the trilobites and again, the different shapes and sizes are also another way, that another index fossil that can help scientists date everything else around it. So if they know that a particular species of trilobite or ammonite is found in a particular layer, they know how old that species is, and it could be a million years of, of its um, when it existed, it can help date everything around that layer to a couple of million years or so. And that's called relative dating. So there's a couple of ways that they do it. They're looking at the rock layers and looking at the other types of fossils they know. And the mass extinctions are actually a really important way that we also date to the, those big periods. So if we have a fossil layer that's got dinosaurs in it, we know that it has to be older than 65 million years ago. We also can then go, well, actually, dinosaurs first came into the fossil record after the Jurassic extinction. So we know that it, the fossils are aged between those two periods. So things that disappeared in one of those mass extinctions, anything after that needs to be younger than that period. OK, any other sort of fossily mass extinction dating questions, Jackie? Otherwise, we'll have a look in more detail. Um, uh, th there's... There are so many questions about fossils, but um, there was one that was interesting um, earlier. Georgie asked, um, uh, Karen, you mentioned earlier uh, that we don't have sa some animals today. Uh, did they evolve or did they just randomly die? Um, it's, that's really quite complicated. I think it's something like 0.0001% of all of the animals that have ever existed species-wise in the history are, are here today. So what we tend to have is a big ex a explosion of evolution and then a mass extinction and then a big what we call a radiation. So a lot of the times it's animals filling those gaps in the habitat. So it could be the big predator. We don't have one type of animals now. We have a different type of animal that's filling that predator. So this will... Hopefully, we'll be able to answer that a bit better when we start talking more about those mass extinctions and the change in the types of animals we had after each one. Okay, Jackie, I think I might go and, and we'll start on that and hopefully that will answer some of our questions as we go through. Okay, so I mentioned trilobites. I did say ammonites were my favourite, but I have to say trilobites are pretty close as well. If you ever get a chance, head out to the Bathurst Fossil and Mineral Museum, um, maybe next year. They have an amazing trilobite collection. You can really see some of the big differences in their body shapes. And that is one of the ways, those in indicator or index fossils that can help us date. And because they lived about sort of 520 million years ago to that 250 million years ago, the Permian extinction. But trilobites also changed throughout that almost 200 million year period of time 
that most of them disappeared in the Devonian extinction 375 million years ago. And there was only a couple of species left until that late Permian extinction. So sometimes we see lots and lots of a particular group and then they disappear or less and less throughout the fossil, um, the fossil record. On average, most species only exist in the fossil record for a couple of million years or so. So some of the ones that we see for very long periods are very, very successful um, in their adaptations. And trilobites were some of the first ones to have that hard outer shell, like an exoskeleton, like what we would just, um, describe an insect having. And they had these hard sort of armor plated. You can see quite a similarity to those sort of centipedes and millipedes um, in their body segment shape. And this is what a, again, this is a scientific illustrator, but this person's using a compu digital computer animation to help with their animation here of what these trilobites would have looked like. What we have here are those ammonites. And again, those comparisons to what some of these would have looked like, again, had been around in the fossil record for a really long time, from about 450 million years ago. Um, even though the classic ammonite group was found from about 200 million years to 66 million years, disappearing at the same time as the dinosaurs. So again, anything that has ammonites in it, we know are older than that 65 million years ago. Again, computer generated one gives us a real idea of the, the animal that lives inside these ammonites. So the idea of these, um, there's a group called cephalopods, which currently are our squids, um, octopus and cuttlefish, that group has been around for such a long time. So the nautiloids are in that, um, had a straight shell with a squid-like animal for the, around the same length of time. And then the different species evolved throughout about 500 million years of history. So quite an amazing group of animals. And that's why they can be used to date the different rock periods. So we're going to jump, we've had our Ordovician extinction at 440 million years ago, and we come into a period of time that's called the age of the fish. And it's called the age of the fish because that's when this group was most common, most popular, when we start seeing all of our early fish from, from animals that, you know, didn't resemble fish at all to the animals that we absolutely can recognise as a fish. So this is an armour-plated fish here. This is one called Dunkleostis that got to the largest. So have a little think. If you've got your space, put your arms out and look at fingertip to fingertip. When I do it, it's about a metre and a half. So that was the size of the head of Dunkleostis. So you can imagine how big this fish actually got. And they had armour-plated heads and they were jawed fish. So they didn't re quite resemble the fish that we have here today. And there was a bit of a battle going on during that time that their jaws had to get bigger to crunch through things like the sea scorpions and the trilobites that were getting harder exoskeletons to beat the fish. So it was a bit of a battle going on in the Devonian seas. During that time, we also started seeing a lot of animals coming out onto land. Once plants came out onto land, where the animals tended to follow. And because of this arms race or, or jaw race in the oceans with the um, armor-plated fish, a lot of our early sort of uh, insect ancestors were coming out on land. We can see them, really that similarity to that body shape with our segmented uh, centipedes. We're seeing dragonflies, amphibians, um, and early reptiles at this time. But still, it was called the age of the fish because there were so many um, of these fish being the top predators at the time. But 70, 375 million years ago, we get this Devonian extinction where 75% of the animals disappeared. And we can see this in the fossil record in Australia. So at a place called Canoundra. So Canoundra, they've got a museum there called the Ages of Fish because that's what was so significant at the time. And they found lots and lots of um, ancient fish fossils at this site. Ooh. And this is one of the slabs that they found here. And again, put your arms out fingertips to fingertips. This is about a metre and a half wide and about two metres tall. And in this one slab is about 140 fish fossils. And we're very nicely, they've colour-coded it for us to show it's of... Um, 
four different species. And this particular fossil was found accidentally. It was knocked over by a bulldozer building a road in the 1950s, and it was almost crumbled up for road base. But luckily, someone noticed, was actually the driver of the bulldozer, thought this was too important because he saw that blue fish, the one right in the center here and was like, I recognize that as a fish. This is really weird. It's a really old rock and actually notified someone at the Australian Museum in Sydney and they came out and had a look. Since then, they have uncovered lots of these slabs and you can actually see it and touch these ones. It is quite amazing. So Conoundra is so important as a fossil fish site. Now, later on, after we finish the session, try to say that 10 times fast. Fossil fish site. Um, that Sir David Attenborough, the famous um, naturalist, has actually come to Conoundra more than once. And there's um, he's done documentaries on the importance and the significance of these fish fossils. So after that Devonian extinction, where we lost 75 percent, we then move in to the life in the Permian. And this is when we start calling it the age of the reptiles. When lots of, after those fish disappeared, lots of space and the habitats were free to be taken over both in the ocean and on land. So remember, this is really early on when we had complex life on land as well. So lots of different reptiles taking over the herbivores and the carnivore roles in, as I said, on land and in the ocean. We're seeing lots of variety of plants coming along and that changes the animals as well. Different types of plants, animals needed different types of teeth to be able to eat them. If they were lower, it actually meant that they things grew higher as well. And I just recently discovered this amazing documentary that was talking about, do you remember when it rained for 2 million years? And guess what? I don't remember, but they have it in the fossil record that they went from this period of time in the Permian when all of the land masses were all squished together, that they didn't get rain inside the middle of those land masses. And it was really dry. And through volcanic eruptions and change, they had this massive rain event that they think it kind of rained pretty much constantly for about two million years. And it changed the land and the animals dramatically because the plants grew taller and that meant the animals needed to be adapted to be taller. And they think this was the beginning of the event that meant that the other reptiles started disappearing and dinosaurs started appearing. So after the Permian, that's when we have what's called the great dying. 95% of all animals disappeared at this time on land and in the water. And it was all due to massive amounts of volcanic eruptions. So kilometres thick of lava they're found in the geological record. They think that, um, that it meant that the rain that was coming down had lots of acid rain in it and it actually turned the oceans quite acidic. So lots of animals in the shallow seas of the ocean that had um, shells, um, the shells became too soft and those animals were dying. So animals that were in uh, the deeper parts of the ocean and in particular habitats were able to survive. So only 5% of the life was able to continue on. And that 5% then led to the animals that we again see today. So after this extinction, we started seeing the life in the Jurassic period. So again, lots of different reptile species being the dominant um, animals, both herbivores and carnivores. And we were seeing the first type of dinosaurs. But just when you think life is continuing on, only 50 million years later, in the end of the Jurassic, 200 million years ago, we have another mass extinction where 80% of the different groups disappeared. So you can see that some of these are quite close together. 50 million years sounds like a long period of time, but for the animals and the, the plants and the habitats, they were just getting themselves back together before this um, extinction happened again. And this one is all about that breakup of Pangaea. This was um, at the end of that period that already had the period of time when they had 2 million years of rain. Um, the continents were breaking up and it changed ocean currents, atmospheric currents um, and had warming. So they were having warming to the oceans and that was changing the species that could live there. And of course, life in the Jurassic we start seeing, um, again, lots of those marine reptiles and lots of land reptiles as well. And 
lots of changes. But if it wasn't for the extinction in both the Permian and the Jurassic, we wouldn't have this period of time that in the Cretaceous, which is the age of the dinosaurs. So at the end of each one of those mass extinctions, it has led to a very important time period where we have different types of animals. Now, the Cretaceous extinction, that's when we lost the dinosaurs. That's when the ammonites finally disappeared. All of the big marine reptiles disappeared. But the groups that remained are the groups that we still see today. So birds are a direct um, ancestor of the dinosaurs. And after the extinction of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago, we come into the time period that's known as the age of the mammals, which is the one that we are still in here today. So 76% of all life on Earth and in the oceans, both plants and animals disappeared. And it, all of these mass extinctions sound like such big impacts and it did it changed the face of the earth it may well have been if you were listening to our dinosaur session earlier uh today that it could have been up to three years after this extinction event that we had the light blocked out so it would have changed global climates plants couldn't get sun all of the the food chain breaks down the herbivores end up dying the carnivores ultimately die as well but animals still continued on and that's when we moved into the age of the mammals and just before I finish with our slides I'd just like to show you this one here this is quite recent in the geological time period and this is a place in Queensland called Riversley so um, a little bit further away than Winton that we talked about before with the dinosaurs and more recently um, to 18 million years ago this is a world recognized fossil heritage site and again this is an artistic illustration of what this um, place would have looked like 18 million years ago because today it looks like this so it's important to remember that over the periods of millions of years these fossil sites often look very very different to what they looked like when um, during those particular time periods so there could have been forests and now it's desert so that's why the fossil record is so important because it can not only give us information of what the animals were there, it can tell us whether it was a shallow sea if we find marine animals, but also things like those amazing coprolites can tell us what plants were there as well. If it's an animal from a herbivore, they can sometimes see seeds and different types of plants that can help them reconstruct the entire habitat from a desert today to a lush rainforest 100 million years ago. Okay, Jackie, I can be now to see you furiously typing away. So I'm ready for questions for the rest of the session. All right. So lots of people want to know uh, whether there will be another mass extinction and whether humans will be affected by it. Okay, well, that is a really great one. So remember, we spoke about mass extinctions being a large number of species disappearing in a short period of time. So unfortunately, there is a lot of research being done at the moment that we could actually be in what's called the sixth extinction um, at the moment because of the numbers of species that are disappearing at the moment. And a lot of these, unfortunately, are due to things like habitat destruction and climate change. Um, Australia, unfortunately, has the... Um, the prize for having the highest mammal extinction of any country in the world. And a lot of that's due to introduced species like rabbits and cats and foxes impacting a lot of our very small uh, mammals in um, uh, arid and dry environments. And those habitats have been removed and the competition with those animals. So in terms of a big mass extinction that's happened from a volcanic eruption or a meteorite impact, we can see small changes um, happening over time. A big volcanic eruption up in Indonesia called Krakatoa put up so much ash and gas into the atmosphere that it did actually, it could actually be um, uh, picked up um, all around the other side of the world. And this happened several hundred years ago. And that year, the Thames, a big river in England, um, froze for the first time in many years. So some people suspected that it could have been that slight change in climate due to all of that um, ash and gas into the atmosphere. So it certainly happens at the moment. We have localised impacts. But if we had lots and lots of volcanic eruptions um, all at the same time, we can absolutely affect global climate. 
Wow. Um, we also have a question from Violet um, about acid rain. So Karen, you mentioned earlier uh, that with acid rain, the ocean became acidic and some of the shells uh, became squishy and the animals inside died. Uh, is there a reason why we don't have acid rain today? And if we did, what impact would that have? Okay, so we do occasionally have localised acid rain um, from big areas where there's lots of industry with lots of gases in the atmosphere and around localised around volcanic um, eruptions. When we're talking about this period, it was... Um, so much volcanic eruptions there was like it was massive amounts of volcanic eruptions happening for years on end um like in in a big area so it'd be not something that would happen localized today um that's why there was so much of it so when we think about these mass extinctions it's not one single volcano going off once it could have been a thousand volcanoes going off for a hundred years um, that had those kinds of impacts. But yes, the chemicals, it's mostly things like sulfur, so lots of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, linking with the other chemicals, um, forming acid rain. Uh, and just a rem um, reminder, guys, there's like over 500 questions, which means if I don't get to yours, that's because there's just so many, uh, we, we might not be able to answer everybody's question. And that's, that's, just the reality of things. You guys have so many really good questions. Um, we're sorry if we don't get to all of them. Yeah. And, um, and just to add there, Jackie, we are going to be sending out an email at the end of the day that covers all of our sessions with extra web links and resources So and, and the recording. So if you've missed something, if you want to replay it, you'll be able to do that later and we'll send you lots of extra information that will answer all of your questions. Uh, um, a common question I've seen uh, is around dinosaurs and whether um, everything, like all the animals now are related to them or which animals are related to them and whether we can like bring them back, I'm guessing like Jurassic Park <laughs> style. So um, yeah, the, okay. that, that's a lot of questions molded into one, sorry. No problems. Well, I'll, I'll cover that in general. So as I mentioned, all of the species that we have today their ancestors have come from the past. So the ones that have made it through that last mass extinction are the ancestors of the animals today. But let's have a think about that. Crocodiles are a great example. Crocodiles have been in the fossil record, well, the group of crocodiles, well before dinosaurs. So they evolved well before dinosaurs and the group that is related to our modern day crocodiles has a continuous fossil line um, to the present. Whereas dinosaurs, there were sort of two groups of dinosaurs and one group, part one of the theropod group, is actually a direct ancestor to birds. So whether or not some scientists will say that birds are dinosaurs and other scientists will say that birds are the direct ancestor of dinosaurs. So either way, birds are the evolutionary endpoint of dinosaurs. So instead of them form, uh, breaking off before dinosaurs from the from reptiles, dinosaurs broke off and then birds broke off from the dinosaur group. But turtles are another group of reptiles that we have around today. And things like our snakes and lizards, they are all reptiles that broke off before the dinosaurs. Mammals, another um, group, they actually were first found in the fossil record about 220 million years ago. So again, um, before the dinosaurs as well. So some of the groups um, have been around for a lot longer and have continued on. Um, and it may be that there was 15 groups, 14 of them disappeared in one of the mass extinctions and one group continued. And that is the branch that continues to where we are today. And that's the same thing if we look at the, that cephalopod group in our mollusks, our squids, um, uh, octopus and cuttlefish, they're related to those ammonites way back when in the fossil record from 400 million years ago. So some of them, the ancestors we can see from a very long time. Trilobites are the ancestors of arthropods, which are our insects, spiders, um, millipedes and centipedes. So we can see those lines going through. Some lines end and others break off and continue before that end point. Hopefully that covered a little bit of that question, Jackie. Uh, yep. Once again, guys, um, we are trying to group questions together so that um, the, the ones that get asked a lot will hopefully um, get answered all together. Um, a lot of people have asked, what is the oldest fossil? 
Okay, so the oldest fossil are those stromatolites, ones that I showed you at the beginning. They kind of look like big rocky mushrooms. So they're the oldest fossils, and what we see when we cut them open are these little growth rings, almost like the growth rings of a tree, that over time, every time the tide goes in and out, we can actually see um, that the sediment attaching and growing. So they're technically the oldest um, sort of organisms and the oldest fossils that we find um, from about, you know, 3.2 billion years old. Awesome. Um, lots of people are asking about your job, Karen. Uh, they think you have a cool job. They think you should write a book. They're asking how come you know all this stuff, how long you've been doing your job for and, uh, and what you needed to do to get to do your job. Excellent. Well, Jackie, I think that's a perfect place to, to wrap up the session as well. So, guys, I started what I do because I love rocks. That's where I started my journey. So when I was about four, I started my first rock collection. I used to collect rocks and I still do. Pretty much don't go anywhere without coming back with a pocket full of rocks. Um, and I actually used to use some rocks and grind them up, and mix them with paint to make paints. So my first journey, I used to just paint pet rocks. And that was the beginning of me going, well, if I break up different rocks, they're different colours, I can add them to different things. Why are some rocks like this? Why are some rocks like that? Um, and that was where my interest started. So I've been collecting things my entire life. And you can see I'm still collecting things now. Um, pretty much every time I go to a museum, I'm always buying um, extra fossils and extra rocks for my collection. And I take this collection out to, to schools when we're allowed to and for presentations like this. Um, I had an interest all the way through school. My two interests were actually rocks and I can found an assignment from primary school. One was on volcanoes and the other one was on sharks. And that has led me to my other passion of scuba diving, which I've been doing for almost 30 years. So a lot of the things I talk about are marine life and um, geology and fossils. So they're two things that I've carried on throughout my life. I went to um, high school and studied science. Um, I then went to university. I went to Macquarie University in Sydney and studied um, paleontology and geology and did a lot of work on landforms and geomorphology, which is um, the study of landforms and soils. And I was extremely lucky to then get a job at the Australian Museum. So at the Australian Museum, I was a science communicator. So I worked with all the scientists to then talk to people like you on tours and events about the science and the research. So that's why I've got lots of different things and I've got lots of different information that I like to share. Um, I worked at the Australian Museum for ooh, 22 years until uh, I left a couple of years ago to, to do more of these programs, to do more um, education and um, talking about the things that I love. So I like to tell stories about my journey. So, yeah, thanks for that question. That's great because it is all about the things that you love and you're passionate about now can be your job in the future. That's why I mentioned that if you love art and love fossils, scientific illustrators could be the job for you. If you like problem solving, you might like to be, you know, design the tools to uncover some of these fossils or um, look for where fossils could be by studying the different soils um, and doing different mapping. So there's so many different jobs out there related to science and it's all about what you're interested in today can be the thing that keeps you going throughout your whole life.